Here's Michael Smirkanish. The United States today is once again headed for civil war and once again cannot bear to face it. January 6 wasn't a wake up call, it was a rallying cry. The United States has never faced an institutional crisis quite like the one that it is facing right now. And finally, the choice is basic reinvention or fall. All of those, the thoughts of my guest, Stephen Marsh. He is the author of a brand new book, The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future. It was published this week. Stephen, thank you for being here. Before we talk about your opinions, just introduce yourself to my audience by way of credentials so they know who they're dealing with. Well, I'm a journalist who worked many years for Esquire and other places, The Atlantic, New Yorker, and so on. I've written for all of those places. And uh, I'm also a novelist. So this is a this book is speculative nonfiction. So it imagines scenarios of a future civil war, but then it's based on about 200 interviews with leading experts in issues from the military, leading military experts, people who are responsible for drawing up battle plans for operations in the homeland, uh, agronomists, uh, political experts, historians, and so on, to drive sort of the closest picture we can get to, to what American collapse might look like. So make the case, why do you believe we are on the brink of such collapse? Well, I, I mean, it's a te- the United States is a textbook case of a country headed for civil war. Uh, I mean, the, the forces are, are several. Uh, hyperpartisanship is one of them. Uh, enormous levels of inequality. The, the inequality levels in the United States right now are, you know, no country has ever not ended in revolution or war or depression after those levels of inequality. Environmental degradation, as well as the delegitimization of institutions. I mean, today, a poll was released that only 20% of Americans have faith in their electoral bodies. And, uh, you know, uh, earlier this week, another poll revealed that one third of Americans think using violence against your own government is acceptable. So, you know, that's- But by the way, by the way, I was, I was in that one third. I mean, I I saw the headline and I was initially alarmed by it. And then I said to myself, wait a minute, I think if I'm answering that question truthfully, I'm in the 34 percent, as I recall, was the the exact number who said that violence might be necessary against government. I was answering that question in a 1776 context. Was violence in that context not necessary against the government? I think that it was. Well, I mean, that is the question of what moment we're at. Are we in a 1776 moment? Right. Like, are we I think we kind of are like we're in. That's a moment of breakdown. Right. I mean, it's also a moment of rebirth and a moment of a birth of a new country, but it's also the breakdown of a system that's not working for anyone. So, you know, I think what happens when you lose the peaceful trend, there are moments in history where the peaceful transition of power is not the right decision. But, you know, we like the American system from 1776 was the greatest system for the peaceful transition of authority ever invented. So, yeah, I mean, I think the fact that that number is going up reveals exactly the scope of how uh, how people are thinking about their own moment in history in America, which as, is as a moment of real crisis. Here's something else that you have written, uh, Stephen Marsh, an incipient illegitimacy crisis is underway. Whoever is yeah. elected in 2022 or in 2024 According to a University of Virginia analysis of census projections, by 2040, 30% of the population will control 68% of the Senate. Eight states will contain half the population. The Senate malapportionment gives advantages overwhelmingly to white, non-college, educated voters. And then you say, in the near future, a Democratic candidate could win the popular vote by many millions of votes and still lose. Do the math. The federal system no longer represents the will of the American people. That's another of the drivers that you see that you say brings us to the brink of civil war. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, you know, the other example, of course, is the Supreme Court, where five out of nine of those justices were selected by presidents who did not win the popular mandate. So if, you know, if they make a big decision on abortion, it, well, frankly, any decision they make now, half of the country is going to feel it's legitimate and half the country is going to feel it's illegitimate. It's these transpartisan institutions that keep countries alive, right? It's these institutions that everyone agrees are, are giving 
adequate answers to the national purpose that are dissolving. And yeah, I mean, I think though, I think it's very easy to get caught up in like Marjorie Taylor Greene's Twitter feed or, you know, will Trump run in 2024? These structural problems are what actually need the bulk of the attention because they're going to create a system where no one can be accepted as legitimate steward of the American people. That that's the crisis, you know. That that's okay. the real crisis. So, so if if I accept your premise that we're at the brink of civil war, might secession? I'm saying the word with very deliberate speak because I don't want to mix it up with one of my favorite TV shows. Might secession be a solution? Today at my website at Smirconish.com, in honor of, of what you've written, I'm asking this question. I'm mimicking the, uh, the UVA Center for Politics. I'm asking, does the discourse in America make you favor either red or blue states seceding? How likely is it, how possible is it, that there would be secession in the United States? It seems to me that secession happens all around the globe each and every year. Yeah, I mean, there are three times as many countries today as there were in 1945, right? I mean, secession is not, you know, only in the American context where secession takes on this very particular dimension around slavery and and this and the North and the South, uh, it, it has a different meaning. But in most of the world, it's not it's not particularly uncommon for states to break up and reform. Um, you know, that said, America is it's very hard in Amer I actually think secession is one of the best case scenarios for the American future. And I think wow. the country being divided into political entities that make more sense to themselves and could fulfill their political visions is perhaps the best case for everyone. But it, it, it's, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's definitely unconstitutional. Like whatever the separatists you have on your show tell you, there's there's no real debate about whether it's constitutional. It's not. And then, you know, another thing is the UN makes it really hard to do because you, have, you need the home state veto and you need the Security Council veto. And without that, you know, it's all very well good to say, you know, don't mess with Texas. We're going to go on our own. But if nobody can land a plane in your airports, you can't exchange currency on the, on the foreign market. You know, you don't have internet protocols. It's very hard to run a country. So, you know, well, isn't there, I, isn't I there a secession... geographical, isn't there a geographical impracticality to it? In other words, if there were a secession by red or blue states, how does California get linked with New York? Oh, I would say that that would be, I mean, this, certainly the California separatists want to go on their own. They want to be their own country. And, you know, incidentally, if they became their own country, they'd be the richest country in the world and immediately by about $20,000 GDP per person. I mean, they are a full, if they want to be a fully functioning country tomorrow, they, they could be. And the same goes for Texas, incidentally, which has a huge diverse economy. And so it's not really right or left. Like you, you, you could definitely divide them. I don't think it would be two countries because I don't think the divisions in the country are North and South. I think they're multiple and there and, and there would be different states. I mean, the real problem is also density because like urban centers like Austin and Texas, that's that's obviously like a blue for fortress in the middle of a red state. Uh, and the same is also true. Like, you know, I have friends in the Hudson Valley of New York who, you know, are, are feel like they're dealing with far right people all the time. So, you know, it, it, there, there are definitely a lot of problems with it. However, they're not all they're not insoluble. Like there are there are ways around them. They, they have been worked out in other countries. So in other words, it's it's not a scenario, and I, and I recognize that we're just spitballing here, but it's not a scenario where the red and the blue divide, even though that's the way that UVA worded their survey question and, and me too, but rather you see it more, in, it's not so much as a slave and free state division that you would hypothetically envision. It's more like Western Europe. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I still think this, the slave non slave state division is pretty intense. And you can see that in a lot of social ways like church membership, uh, gun ownership, proximity to abortion access. Do you know any gay married couples like there's a whole bunch of social distinctions that still survive between slave state and non state and also Trump. Biden, you know, the same the same division. But, um, you know, the, the chaos, like the civil war that I'm worried about is not north south. It's chaos versus what order. is it? Right. It's it's chaos versus order. It's 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 sectarian violence, uh, militant violence uh, for in the normalization of political horror uh, against, you know, government, essentially government. 
right? Essentially like the, the right of the federal government to have laws. And, uh, and, and, and so those are, you know, that's, that's the struggle. And so when you think about secession, I think you really have to think about um, what, how those divisions would be ref reflected. And it, 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 I mean, it's, it's super complicated. I mean, it, I go into quite a bit of technical detail in the book about how to do it, uh, but it's a legal nightmare, right? It's a, le it, it, it's a complete bureaucratic quagmire. The, by the way, the book is called The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future. Stephen Marsh is the author. It just came out this week. Didn't Justice Scalia close the door on whether secession the right to secede could ever take place in the United States? Well, he said, he's clear it's unconstitutional, but you know, there's not, there's no legal scholars of any political stripe, le legitimate ones, I guess I would say, like at a, at a law school or something, who would really argue that secession is legal. However, you know, it's not legal for Catalonia to separate from Spain either. It, like, it's not legal for Quebec to separate from Canada either. That doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. Right. It, like it, like it, 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 the constitutions break down. That's why you get secession. Right. So it's there. And, you know, they're extra legal. Like secession is a historical event. It's not really a legal event. So, you know, if the if the history changes, then the laws will catch up. And that's that tends to happen in the rest of the world. And I assume that's what it would look like in America. In fact, it would you have made, to. you. You made reference to this, but let me just lay it out with more detail. If these are your words, if Texas were a country, it would have a GDP of 1.59 trillion, 10th in the world, slightly below Brazil, slightly ahead of Canada. It would certainly look like a country, 47th in population, 40th in size. California is even larger with a GDP of 2.88 trillion. It recently passed Britain to become the fifth largest economy in the world, it would rank 36th in population with the world's largest technology and entertainment sectors. A separate California would have the largest national median income in the world. What would be the form of currency in the country of Texas or the country of California? And how much of an impediment might that present? Oh, it's huge. Like the technical issues around things like pensions, military, you know, federal institutions like NASA. I mean, Ted Cruz said, you know, we'll take NASA. It's like, I mean, I, just to be clear, like true separatists like uh, Miller of the of the Texas Nationalist Party are, are much more sophisticated and much more clear about the, the difficulties of this. But yeah, I mean, the, the thing is like for Quebec, if Quebec were to separate, it would still be a French language country in a largely English speaking economy of North America. But Texas and California are the new economy. Right, they are the most successful regions in the world at, at, in the in the in the twenty first century. So, yeah, they would they would definitely if they separated. I think they could have a good shot at at. I mean, you know, they wouldn't be the United States of America anymore. They wouldn't have global power like they do now. But as as small countries on the level of Brazil or Canada, I think they could flourish for for sure. I do. So it's it sounds. I mean, it's it's a great. Bar room. I'm not being dismissive of, of you advancing the idea, and the, the book is intriguing, The Next Civil War, but it does sound like a, a, a fantastical barroom conversation to talk about secession in the United States when you're thinking big picture for the country. But what about in a scenario like Oregon and Idaho? I mean, do you, yeah. I'll ask it this way do you think that 50 years from now, I won't be here to see it. Hopefully you will be. But 50 years from now, do you think the map of the United States will look exactly the way it looks today? No, I don't. I can't imagine it would. That's a, that's a really interesting way of putting it. But something's got to give one way or the other. Yeah, absolutely not. That's a really good way. Like of what, what, cha what I mean, change comes to your mind? What, what do you think? What well, can look, you envision 50 years? You know, in, in this book, I'm trying to be really specific. I work on very specific models that I think are the best and which I trust and which, you know, nobody knows how things are going to work out. Like no, nobody, like nobody knows what, when the fall will be. It's what these trends are, are like and, and how these things work over history. So, you know, there, there, I definitely make calls about what the future will look like in this book, but just a little bit, like I, I, as far as I can actually see, I definitely can't see 50 years in the future because what America is, is a complex cascading system. I mean, that's the, that's the technical term for it. And what that means is that 
factors feed into each other and they they go into uh they feed into each other into so that they create these effects that are surprising but can absolutely be seen and and so what that means is that you can't that's why the unimaginable keeps happening that's why if five years ago you'd said there will be there'll be tanks on the streets of washington during the summer uh, uh during july 4th no one would have believed you but it happened you know it happened well, i've been so uh, from my perspective i've i've been paying close attention for 30 years and i'm yeah. wondering about things now that never entered my thought process at any point previous i mean for example the map of the united states i've always taken it as a given that of course it's always going to look the way that it looks and then i hear then i hear you say that separatism is a global political trend as you made reference the number of nations in the world has tripled since 1945 right now there are about 60 secessionist movements worldwide 60 independence movements is a pretty large number by historical standards uh so says ryan griffiths who's a syracuse Professor, you get the final word. Wrap up and, and tell my audience, what, what is it that Stephen Marsh most wants people to know about this moment in history? Okay. The, the, the problem is not horse race politics, and the problem is not who is going to win in 2022 or who's going to win in 2024. The problem is the structure of the U.S. government is increasingly leading towards illegitimacy and violence is rising. And what needs to happen, there needs to be, first of all, a generational effort from the FBI to snuff out domestic terrorism, which is, will be the work of a generation. Like It will be like getting the mob out of the NYPD. It will take a lot of work. I mean, they are brilliant, so I think they can do it. But the other thing is there needs to be a really profound reexamination of whether the Constitution works anymore, whether the system of government is actually reflective of democratic processes, and whether it reflects the will of the American people, and whether America has the possibility. It is the great country of reinvention, right? It is the great country of, of starting yourself over, starting, your, starting a country over. It's going to have to do that again. It's going to have to do that. Yeah, there, again. there are and, there are just such institutional roadblocks to bringing about the the sort of changes. I mean, you you talk about the the over representation of rural states. I, I can't imagine that that there could ever be the necessary constitutional change to to alter something like that. Uh, I worry about how bad it has yeah. to get before people will be open to those sort of ideas. I'm sorry, I stepped on your final line. What did you want to say? No, that's me. That's me. I was just going to totally agree with you. I mean, like, you know, it, it is very hard. But when the other option is violence, like, you know, I've talked to some people on, on, as touring this book who think that a civil war is a good idea. Like, you know, people with television shows who think a civil war is a good idea. I mean, it, it never occurred to me once writing this book that anyone would make that argument. I mean, violence is horrible. Political violence, when it spirals out of control, gets really terrible really fast. So I think, you know, you're going to need radical thinking because the alternative is so horrific. The next civil war dispatches from the American future. Stephen Marsh, thank you so much for being here. It's a provocative conversation, and I really appreciate it. Real pleasure. Thanks for having me.